A couple decides to divorce, but the situation becomes more complicated. Tamati is afraid of his spouse's behavior. In time, he will realize that his fears had a basis. Tim and Larissa are going through a very complicated divorce in which the main problem is this money. She is unwilling to share half of her assets with her husband and makes a decision that will change the course of events forever. Larissa Foreman was born on January 1, 1960, on a farm in Clarence, Missouri, USA. Her parents were Charles and Diane Foreman. The young girl lived a quiet life on the family farm. She was an outstanding student and a resident assistant at the University of Missouri. She majored in biochemistry. While in college, Larissa worked at a hospital where she met Timothy Schuster, who also grew up on a farm, but in a different Illinois village. He was studying to be a nurse at the time. Soon after they met, feelings were sparked between them and a courtship began that lasted about three years. They married in 1982, and three years later they had a daughter named Christine. Four years later, Larissa found a great high-paying job at a plant research lab in Fresno, California. It was an opportunity they couldn't pass up, so the family traveled to the city. Things went very well for Larissa at work. She was a professional in her field and an entrepreneur, so it wasn't long before she opened her own lab focusing on agricultural biochemistry. In 1990, the couple welcomed a second child, Tyler. At the time, Larissa found it challenging to juggle all of her responsibilities. Between the house, the kids, and the new business, she was tired. She would leave the house in the morning and return late at night, obviously very tired. Then she and Tim made a deal. He would put his career on hold for a while to take care of the children and other household chores. This worked for a while, but then the husband wanted to go back to work. He wanted to take short shifts at the hospital so that he could be home with his children and take care of the household. The work of the two began to pay off, and soon after the business opened, they moved into a new, large house. Everything seemed to be going well. Everyone thought they were the perfect family. They attended church and Tim was a member of the local Masonic Lodge, but behind closed doors the situation was very different. After 21 years of marriage, the relationship fell apart. At the root of all the couple's problems was money, not because they lacked it, on the contrary. Larissa had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in her business. Tim wasn't lagging behind either. Between six shifts and a few extra jobs, he managed to save 70000 a year. Obviously, this made their lives very comfortable. But since Tim made half as much as his wife, Larissa complained about her husband's conformity and lack of ambition. In 2001, Larissa admitted that she had cheated on her husband in 1993, as of 2002. Christine, the couple's eldest daughter, began living with her maternal grandparents to be closer to the university she had chosen to attend, but also to get away from the tense atmosphere in the house. That same year, Tim and Larissa's relationship stalled and they decided to divorce. The divorce process encountered two stumbling blocks, custody of their youngest son, Tyler, and division of marital assets. In February 2002, Larissa filed for divorce and custody of their son. She had no intention of giving up anything she felt she had earned through her efforts and accused Tim of being useless at making money. At the beginning of the trial, the couple decided to divide their house into two parts. The size of the property made this possible, but Larissa wanted to keep everything. She felt that Tim had no right to enjoy the wealth she had created. Tim did not agree with Larissa's comments. He said that although he had not contributed financially to the purchase of material possessions such as the house, cars, and other things, he had contributed to raising the children and taking care of the house. He said that the fact that he stayed home and did all the housework was a very important support in Larissa's career. Because of this, she was able to devote herself fully to developing the business and looking after the well-being of the company. Tim also said that because he stayed home and supported his wife's dream, he was not able to pursue his career as he would have liked. He filed a counterclaim seeking $1 million in damages. After Tim filed this countersuit with Larissa, their home life became unbearable. So in July of that year, the man packed up and moved into his own apartment. At the time, Larissa was out of town. The man decided to take several pieces of furniture that he thought belonged to him. When the woman returned and realized this, she was furious. She told several friends and co-workers that she wanted Tim to die. It would be better for her to remain a widow than to go through all the divorce proceedings. Larissa also said that she would take everything away from Tim. 
She asked a co-worker named Leslie to do her a favor and rent a moving box near the lab on the pretext that she wanted to keep some things out of Tim's reach. Leslie complied and rented the box in her name. She gave Larissa the code so that Larissa would have access. Larissa then asked a young man named James, who worked with her in the lab and even babysat her son, to help her retrieve some items from Tim's house that were allegedly stolen. This seemed fair to James. One afternoon, taking advantage of Tim's absence, the two of them broke into the house and took all the items Larissa remembered as having been in their home. They took them to a storage unit Leslie had rented, and when Tim returned home, he panicked. At first he thought he had been robbed, but then it became clear who was responsible by the missing items and the missing paperwork he was going to provide to get custody of his son. Frightened by his wife's subsequent actions, Tim decided to install an alarm system and motion sensors. Since the man no longer had to take care of the house and children, he began working full-time at the hospital. He told some co-workers that he was frightened by Larissa's behavior and even got a permit and bought a gun for protection. To keep Tim similarly depressed, Larissa later sought custody of Tyler. The man was only allowed to see his son twice a month on weekends. On Wednesday, July 9, 2003, Tim had dinner with his friends Mary, Bob, and Victor. It was not a happy reunion. Mary and Tim had been laid off from the hospital that day due to a reduction in force, and they were scheduled to have a layoff interview with Human Resources at the health center the next day. After dinner, Tim and Mary agreed to have breakfast together the next day before going. They said goodbye and went to their respective homes. That was the last time the friends saw Tim alive. The next day, Mary was expecting Tim for breakfast, but he didn't show up. She kept calling, but he didn't answer his cell phone. It was very strange, but she thought that maybe Tim had overslept or had already left for a business meeting and thought she would meet him there. Mary had gone to a meeting about leaving the medical center, but Tim never showed up. He was very responsible and couldn't miss a meeting like this because it was very important to close out all his business at the hospital. She got very nervous and called Bob and Victor because they were the last people he had been with the night before. Victor decided to go to Tim's apartment. He knocked on the door, but no one answered. Outside the building, he saw his friend's car parked. He looked inside and saw the man's cell phone, wallet, and watch. This was strange because Tim never went anywhere without his cell phone. He called Mary to tell her what had happened, and they decided to go to the police. They were very worried that Tim had gotten himself into trouble because he was going through a divorce and had been fired from his job. They wanted the police to enter the apartment and see if Tim was there. The officer's response stunned them. They had to wait 24 hours for the disappearance to be counted and only then could they start looking for Tim. The friends had nothing to do but wait. On that day, Tim also did not pick up Tyler, who was supposed to meet him. He was supposed to pick up his son at the place where Larissa usually got her nails done. The manicurist noticed that Larissa looked very happy that day, although she was very nervous. She was sweating a lot, and it was difficult to get the glue on her nails. 24 hours after the disappearance, since Tim hadn't picked up Tyler, the first thing the police did was check the man's apartment. The police found a gun hidden under a chair cushion. It was obvious that Tim was afraid of something. When they searched his briefcase, they found a small tape recorder with a cassette tape in it. According to the caller ID list on his phone, the last call had been at 2 o'clock on the day he disappeared, and it had come from his ex-wife's phone. So Larissa was the first person called in for questioning. When questioned, the woman talked about the difficulties of the divorce and admitted that the last conversation she had with Tim was on Tuesday, July 8th, when he was supposed to pick up Tyler. Larissa planned that after a weekend with her father, Tyler would take her to Disneyland and then to Missouri to visit family. The woman said that since Tim didn't show up to pick up her son, and since she called and he didn't answer, she took the boy home. The woman said the last call she made was at 10.30 a.m. on July 9th. She also said she fell asleep on the couch with her phone that night while watching a movie, and when she woke up, she saw that a short call had been made from speed dial to her ex-husband's number in the early morning hours of July 10th. Both investigators asked for her cell phone, but Larissa claimed that she had left it at home. That seemed very strange. Then one of the agents went outside to get some air. Larissa's car was parked at the entrance and there was a cell phone in it. The agent then dialed a number to make sure it was Larissa's phone, and it was. He assumed that the woman was hiding something on the phone. 
The agent returned to the interrogation room and told Larissa that her cell phone was in the car. The agents escorted her outside. She pulled out the phone and that's when her demeanor changed. She was very nervous and her hands were shaking. She was then asked to let them check the phones and found that Tim's number was not on speed dial. She couldn't have called him by mistake. Larissa finally admitted that she had lied. She had called Tim that morning to confirm that he would be picking up Tyler that morning, but she didn't know what happened to the man after that. Despite these lies, the police said they had no evidence to hold the woman and released her, but they did look at her call history beforehand. They noticed that Larissa had been calling one number very persistently for the last few days. When they identified the owner of the number, they realized it was James Fagone, the same man who had helped Larissa move things out of Tim's apartment a few weeks ago. The police wanted to know the content of the calls between James and Larissa. They called the man, who was only 21 years old at the time. After a few questions, he broke down in front of the officers and told them everything that had happened. He said that Larissa had taken Tim's life the same morning she called him. James told the police that Larissa had asked him to go back to Tim's apartment a second time after they had moved things out of there a few weeks ago, claiming that Tim had robbed her again and she wanted her furniture back. James believed everything she said, so he agreed to go with her. Larissa also offered him a reward. Larissa also asked him to buy a stun gun. She said to take it for extra protection if Tim suddenly showed aggression. James accepted everything. He was the one who revealed that they had gone to Tim's house that morning. Larissa rang the doorbell and Tim let her in. Larissa then took a stun gun and completely incapacitated her ex-husband. He said he didn't know what was going to happen between the exes until the woman asked him to bring Tim to her house. There was a barrel in the shed and she began filling the barrel with acid. James told police that they put Tim in the barrel and that he believed the man was alive when they did so. Investigators believed and confirmed that Larissa purchased a large barrel over several days, delivered it to the lab, and then delivered it to a shed near the house. She also purchased large quantities of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. In total, four cases of six bottles each were purchased, three cases of hydrochloric acid, and one case of sulfuric acid. The company used no more than one bottle per year to sanitize some instruments in the lab. In addition, one of Larissa's co-workers reported that Larissa was late for work that day. The woman said that her muscles were sore after exercising, but this was very strange since she always arrived much earlier. After spending a few hours in the lab, Larissa said she had to leave for an emergency and did not return that day. After all this, the police obtained a search warrant for her home as well as her rented cubicle. A box of empty bottles of hydrochloric acid was found in the trash outside the woman's home. A search history of the acids and animal tissue was left on Larissa's computer. On July 16th, six days after Tim's disappearance, police broke into a rented box and found a barrel containing half of Tim's body. A warrant was issued for Larissa's arrest at the same time as this discovery, and the woman was arrested a day later at the airport as she returned with her son from Disneyland to her parents' home in Missouri. Larissa had her own version of events. She blamed James for everything. James allegedly told Larissa that he was going to Tim's house to rob him. But Tim discovered them, so she only helped him hide the body. While all this was going on, the forensic examination of Tim's remains was underway. It was very difficult to get samples. We had to use special suits because of the strong smell from the barrel. Only the arm bones were left of Tim's torso. The identity had to be confirmed with DNA. A small amount of chloroform residue was found in the body tissues, but it could not be determined if Tim was still alive when he was submerged in the acid barrel. According to the prosecution, the investigation and the available testimony, the following happened on that tragic morning. Larissa asked Tim to meet her at his house. She had to come up with a good excuse to make it easy for him to open the door for her. Remember, he kept guns at home and had a security system in place. Investigators believe that Larissa told Tim that her son Tyler was sick and that they needed to see each other. Anyway, when Larissa called, Tim opened the door. James hid in a calibrated place where Tim couldn't see him. When he opened the door, James came out of hiding and knocked the man down. Larissa used a stun gun. Police don't know exactly what killed Tim. They learned from James's testimony that the two of them picked up Tim's body and carried it to the car. That was difficult enough, considering the man's size and weight. They then drove to Larissa's house and entered the shed. As James had said, they put Tim in a barrel and Larissa started pouring acid into it. Tim's legs were sticking out of the barrel, so according to James, Larissa cut them off. 
Since there are no bones left from that part of Tim, this cannot be confirmed. In the end, all they had was James's testimony. After that, Larissa asked James to close the barrel and then take it to the storage box. James complied, then Larissa showed up for work. A few hours later, she went to the barn to clean up all the evidence. James was also arrested by the authorities, and a trial began in November 2006. The first trial was for the James. The defense insisted that he was very afraid of Larissa, that the woman had threatened him, and that he always thought like a criminal. The man was acquitted of kidnapping, but found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. James's conviction brought good news for Larissa. James would not testify at her trial because he was busy with his appeal and the prosecution had nothing to offer him since he had already been sentenced to life in prison. Another piece of good news for Larissa was that the judge wouldn't allow the prosecution to put the tape of James confessing to the police on the stand. He said it was impossible because the defense wouldn't have a chance to talk to James and question him, so it wouldn't benefit either side. On October 22, 2007, the jury trial that would ultimately decide Larissa's fate began. Larissa's defense placed all the blame on James. A forensic psychiatrist's report was presented stating that she was unusually traumatized and the victim of emotional abuse by Tim. Larissa admitted that she had told several people that she wanted Tim dead, but claimed that it was only emotionally related to Tim's custody suit and his demand for a million dollars. In the end, she said, she never meant it. Larissa spoke in court and stuck to the last statement she made to the police. She said that James came to her house the day Tim was killed. James told Larissa that he went to Tim's house with the intention of committing a robbery, but it didn't go the way he thought it would. As a result, he used too much of the stun gun and the man stopped breathing. Larissa told the court she was horrified by what she heard. She couldn't think clearly, and the last thing on her mind was to go to the police and turn James in. The only thing she wanted to do was help the boy. Then she remembered the barrel she had and the gallons of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid she had bought earlier. Larissa said that she had made the purchase because she was going to do a major cleanup of all the lab equipment and she would need a lot of acid. She told James to go to Tim's apartment and retrieve his body. They took him to a shed, put him in a barrel, and filled it with acid. James then took the barrel to a place where she kept things, and that's how it all happened, according to Larissa's account. The police never believed this story. She was asked about the $2,000 she had deposited into James's account, and she said it was payment for various jobs he had done, including taking care of her son. Finally, the prosecution played nearly two dozen voicemails that Larissa sent to Tim that contained horrible and demeaning insults and threats. This exposed the terrible rage instilled in the defendant. After two days of deliberation, the jury came back with a verdict guilty of first-degree murder for profit, as the prosecution concluded that the woman got rid of her ex-partner to keep all the money. On May 16, 2008, after several appeals, the sentence was handed down, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Larissa tried to appeal this sentence, but all appeals were rejected in 2011. Tyler is left to live with his maternal grandparents. They do not facilitate any communication with his sister. Christine is now married and has a son. She confirms that she is not aware if her brother knows the full story. Moreover, she does not know what story the grandparents told the boy. This case illustrates where ambition can lead. Due to the lack of a prenuptial agreement, the couple had to divide all acquired property in half, regardless of who put in how much money or resources. Larissa did not want to do this and chose to take her ex-husband's life, believing that no one would notice and that he would eventually be recognized as missing or believe that he had taken his own life because of his problems. In the end, she and her co-conspirator are imprisoned and punished for life. It's unclear exactly how this situation has affected Tyler. Is he aware of the whole situation? A family was destroyed because of Larissa's selfish act. Thank you for watching.